What's up, guys? It's Derek Kirby with the Dallas Prospect, back to talk a little bit of Mavericks basketball with you here. The Mavericks get a 109-108 victory in San Antonio last night, get back on the right side of the win column after getting more or less run off the floor late against the Heat the other night. This is a good win for Dallas in that it's got a little grit. It still continues the trend that when they play a playoff team, they get thumped. And when they play a lottery team, they have to scratch and claw. So it's a mixed bag. There are a lot of problems with this team we've talked about. We've talked about the floor spacing. We've talked about the lack of three-point shooting. Guys that you depend on to be good three-point shooters who for their careers or for the at least the recent sample of recent years have been good three-point shooters and are just not doing so right now. That includes Luka Doncic, that includes Dorian Penny smith that includes Sterling Brown, that includes Reggie Bullock, that includes Chris Hobbs Porzingis. You could pretty much run down the list and see everybody either performing at or below, and it, it, there's only a couple instances where someone's performing right about in line with their usual mark. Most people are performing below, and that trend really continued here last night in San Antonio. The Mavericks shot just 23% from the three-point line, excuse me, 24%, eight of 34, that's abysmal. They, for the from the field in general, shot 43%, but you look at, like, Jalen Brunson, one of the big, I would say Brunson was your hero of the night last night, not just for how he took over the game late in the fourth quarter, but even he, one of four from three, Luka, three of 12, Hardaway, three of nine, Dodo, 0 oh of four, Sterling Brown, one of two, Frank Nilakina. 0 of 2, Reggie Bullock 0 of 1. Only seven minutes, by the way, for Reggie Bullock. I'm not sure about that, but this game was a lot more grit than you would have liked to have had because you don't feel like you should be in slugfests with lottery teams unless you yourself or are in that discussion kind of bordering on a playoff team. It's early. I'm not going to project that far, but the problems are notable with this team. They are well documented through eight games, five and three, and they've had a pretty manageable schedule thus far. So in this, you get in 36 minutes, Jalen Brunson gets his second straight start. He was probably the best player for the Mavericks in the loss to the Heat, and that was really the case again last night. He goes for 31 points, his second career 30-point game, 10 rebounds, three assists on 9 of 17 from the field. A lot of work at the free throw line as well, including 12 of 15. However, two of them, two of those misses are huge. Now, Brunson said after the game he intentionally missed the second free throw, but uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't do it right. It's amazing that a guy who even was a, a, a full-time player throughout college, not just a one-and-done, still at this stage doesn't remember like, oh yeah, I got to hit the rim on the miss. So even though the Spurs didn't have a timeout and you were going to have a situation where, oh, I'm trying to run out the clock. Well, by not hitting the rim, you're giving them an out of bounds at the half court line. So not really what you want because the Spurs have a last gasp trying to steal a win and probably in the final moment and almost do. It's a good save by uh, the Spurs there, but the Mavericks are able to snatch the ball before complete disaster ensues. So Dallas gets away with it, but Brunson in this game was sensational. In the final four minutes, he had 13 points in the fourth quarter, pretty much all of which came in that final few minutes. Uh, sensational. Off the dribble, step back mid-range, Jay. Great, great performance for him. We've been saying like he's a dude that needs to get paid, and he's playing like it right now. I would say next to Luka Doncic, who has not been very, by his standards, I should clarify, not very good good consistently this year Jalen Brunson's probably been your second best player because last night you had your fifth consecutive game that Kristaps Porzingis has missed now with lower back tightness now I'm not trying to say lower back tightness is nothing and I understand how it can be something that you miss a couple games something to that effect but unless there's something more structurally wrong I can't explain the amount of time he's missing and that's what's really concerning is that the Mavericks have played eight games. He's been available for three. And we were initially kind of indicated to that, like, oh, he might miss a game, maybe at worst two. Well, it's been a few games since that time. 
and we're still kind of sitting here like, oh, hopefully the next game, next game, by the way, in a couple days is against the Boston Celtics at the double AC. So it's like, oh, hopefully next game, dude, how are we still waiting? There's like, you remember when he tore the meniscus in the bubble in the playoffs against the Clippers and they kind of waited a couple of days to actually finally tell us what happened. They were just like, oh, you know, he's having some soreness. And they're like, OK, JK, he uh, he's going to need surgery. It, it was that sort of development. Now, I'm not saying that's what's happening here, but it's a little bit weird how they're aware of the narrative around him and his, you know, inconsistency or inability, I should say, to remain healthy. But it kind of feels like they shield it initially. We're like, oh, soreness, tightness, discomfort. And then he misses more time than you would expect, given those labels. And then sometimes they just come back and they're like, uh, actually, we're going to have to shut him down for a while. It's a concern at this point for quote unquote revenge season, which I was one of those people kind of pushing that narrative, feeling that, hey, man, full healthy off season coming in for the Mavericks for the first time. He's going to be ready. He's not ready. And I'm starting to lose all patience and willingness to work with that. But even still back to the game here, the Spurs, I really like. Uh, they're a young team. Like, they're not going to be a playoff team. Certainly not in the West like it's currently constructed. But they got a lot of young talent. And I know Popovich is going to be stepping away, it sounds like, at the end of the year. I think he's leaving them in a good in a good position as as much as you can. And, you know, that's, that's a testament to him. I, I might have hated the Spurs for, you know, pretty much the entirety of the Dirk Duncan era that overlapped. But... They're a classy organization and they've done well. You really can't hate how they've built their team and their franchise over the last 25 or so years. Anyway, uh, in the game, you don't get the three point shooting you need. The Mavericks just 24 percent from beyond the three point line. They do a better job forcing turnovers and rebounding. However, they forced 10 turnovers. Yes, they committed 10 themselves, but they forced 10 turnovers and they won the rebounding battle by 16, including 15 offensive rebounds. Why is that? Because another hero of this game for the Mavericks, the guy I'm going to say probably had the second biggest impact overall is Boban. Boban Marjanovic, 15 minutes, 17 points, five boards, eight of 10 from the field. Yeah, yeah, that's a big impact. A plus 17 for the game. That is monstrous. Why? Because the Spurs didn't have an answer for the size inside. And as bad as Dwight Powell has been at times this year, you did see early on in the game him working that lob threat well in the pick and roll with Luka. He got pretty much three quick baskets and then went dormant, only took four shots overall in the game, despite three of them coming in the first handful of minutes. And uh, Boban really was able to control the paint inside and do a lot of scoring in the low post, which really kept Dallas largely in control of this game. I know San Antonio started to build towards a double digit lead there late in the third quarter. Just the energy and everything they were bringing mixed with the Mavericks inept three point shooting made this a lot closer than it should be. Um, but I think Jalen and Boban are your two heroes of this game for the Mavericks. Luca. Yeah, he was, you know, by Luca standards, it was another very eh game for him. T 10 of 25 from the field. He does give you 23 points, 12 rebounds, and 7 assists. But again, 0 of 2 at the line. The free throw concerns remain for Luca. 3 of 12 from 3. Not a good shooting night for Luca. But you know, one, one thing that I did appreciate was that willingness to trust, uh, trust in Brunson late in the game. Brunson started taking over, really targeting Doug McDermott former Maverick, and uh, abusing him, abusing him off the dribble. And they kept going at him. And Luca basically said after the game, like, look, that's a good matchup and Jalen's cooking. Why would I take it from him? Like that, that to me is a, a sign of buying in and trusting in your team and, and the growth. We can talk about how many times he, he drives and dishes to a wide open shooter and hey, he's trusting them to make the shot. True, but it's another form of trust when you can say, dude, he's cooking. I'm not even going to try and take the ball from him right now unless I'm his outlet. Then I'll deal with it. But Brunson, the way he was cooking and that mismatch, they were working again and again and again, came up huge for Dallas. Brunson, again, 13 points in the fourth quarter. And, uh, you know, you could say he kind of botched 
the end there at the free throw line. If he makes the first free throw, then he doesn't even have to worry about trying to miss the second one, but then fails to execute that properly. And so suddenly San Antonio has a chance to steal it. Regardless, it's a one point win. It's good to avoid a two game losing streak, but you still have a lot of these same concerns that we're talking about. People keep saying like, hey, it's early. You know, it's a full season. It's early. It's a new coaching staff. They're trying to figure it out. And people who are trying not to be so critical of Kid are more than willing to be critical of Igor, I've noticed, saying like, well, it's his offensive scheme. Kid just kind of manages everything from a, a top level view. And they said it was the same with Carlisle when the Mavericks had the most efficient offense in NBA history. Well, it was that Silas had that system. And they'll cite even to the 2011 championship that the suggestion to interject J.J. Barea to the starting lineup was a recommendation from an assistant on the staff. And so, like, you'll see that. Like, uh, you'll see those recommendations and that it's just kind of knowing what buttons to push and kind of making a judgment call based on the evidence and the, the data presented to you. Fine, but I still think this team is in a world of hurt. You can say how much of it is kid versus Igor or whatever. I still feel like this team is in disarray. And it's not to say that they're a horrible team, but for a team that had so much positive energy and anticipation behind it entering the season, I'm hard pressed to say that at least as it stands right now through, you know, eight games that, or is it, I keep saying eight games and now I'm suddenly saying like, is it actually nine? Let's see, the Mavericks here are five and three. No, it's eight games. I For some reason, I got ahead of myself for a second. Um, through eight games, I, I think if you had last year's exact Mavericks, which is to say almost the same roster as they have now, but Carlisle is the coach and that coaching staff versus this Mavericks group, would they be better? Uh, I think the Carlisle group would be ahead right now, but we'll see where they end up as we approach the midpoint of the season, you know, the deadline and all that. And then, of course, playoff time where they're at. But <laughs> right now, the Mavericks are still third in the Western Conference. So we can say, hey, man, they have like one of the two worst point differentials in the league right now. And anytime they play a worthwhile team, they're getting run. Yeah, they played pretty well against Miami for the most part. But the Heat are a really, really good team. And I know like you can't keep making that excuse when they lose to the teams that are playoff teams from last year. I know. We said that about Atlanta. They were in the Eastern Conference Finals last year, and they look really good again this year. We said that about the Miami game. We said that about the Denver game. Like, I get it. I hear you, and I get it. The bigger thing to me is this team never seems like it's in control of the game. They might be able to hang around and kind of keep it a little bit interesting, but they never soundly control a game and run the other team off the floor. And I do think that's a little bit of concern at this point is even when they're playing bad teams, the Kings, although they've struggled against the Kings uh, early on in Luca's career, uh, the Kings, for instance, the Raptors are not a very good team. They did get wins in each of those cases, but it's just like you look at it and you're like, mm, there's something there's something there. There's something or rather not there that is keeping this team from doing what it needs. Some people will point to it. I know this is, it's the more apologist perspective. They'll look at it and they'll tell you, hey man, it's just a three point shooting. If they're making their shots and they're getting those looks all day long, if they're just making their shots, then you don't have to worry about it so much because it'll take care of itself. The problem is so many guys right now are not hitting their shots. Well, that's a structural thing to an extent. When the, when the spacing is not good, that's a problem. When you don't have another consistent playmaker outside of Luka, that's a problem because the Mavericks offense boils down to Luka dribbles around, drives and dishes. And you can have effectiveness with that, but at times when it's he drives and dishes, the guy waits his tick and then gives it back to him and the possession just has to continue in this frantic kind of pace, it becomes too one-dimensional. And They've addressed that a little bit by bringing Brunson into the starting lineup, and he has thrived in those two games. But you do have a little bit of a, a problem, I think, where, OK, well, if Brunson's in your starting lineup now, your only guy who could really kind of create off the second unit is not there anymore. He's gone from that role. 
So maybe you try to stagger the minutes a little bit to offset, but it's just an awkward situation where the lack of guys that can really operate off the dribble, by the way, one of the reasons, that's probably one of the reasons why Trey Burke is still around, uh, given how how mud his name was in the offseason. I think the fact that he's one of the few guys that can kind of do that consistently is giving him that opportunity. So the Mavericks have some problems to figure out because, all right, are you going to... Right now, you're having a situation where you're putting where you're putting your guys in position. You're trying to put your best guys out there. And you have a weird lineup here for the Mavericks where it's Brunson, Doncic, and Hardaway. You're effectively starting three guards. And that's an undersized rotation, not or undersized starting lineup. Not to mention the fact that Dwight Powell hasn't even been an effective center this year. As far as starting centers go, I think early on he's been in like the bottom three or four most efficient in terms of the starters. So not good for them in the in the front court situation. And you're having to run real small starting Dorian Finney Smith in this case at power forward. It's just a problem. And I think with Dorian, it, as simple as his usage was last season, where it was just like, hey man, just defend and just spot up three. That's it. Now that you're trying to have him do a little more off the dribble and a little more in the post up and pull up game, I feel like they're I feel like they're throwing him off by throwing more at him. And it's taking away from the overall effectiveness of what he did before. If he'd finally kind of mastered that role before, why would you then, you know, continue to to restructure it and to ask more, even if it's just in a more dynamic sense, more of him, even if it's not from a usage standpoint? I'm not sure about that. Sterling Brown, uh, 19 minutes, three points, five boards, three assists. One of three from the field that was a three-pointer. I don't know what to say on that front. Um, not not a strong start for him in his Maverick career. Uh, Frank Nilakina, 16 minutes, 0 of 6 from the field, 0 of 2 from 3. He does give you four uh, boards two points and an assist, but yeah, it's a little bit of a dud for him. He's been good for them and their team plus minus has been very strong with him early on in the year, but this was not a strong performance at all. And uh, I think you need to also take a a review of Willie Cauley-Stein. I think his effort at times has been atrocious this year. And I don't know for how many centers you have on this team it's really freaking weird that it feels like you don't have any centers at all. Like, you have Boban, you have Moses, who you won't play, not consistently at least, and then you have a lot of guys who are either ineffective or low effort or inconsistent effort at the very least. That's not good. Like, if this thing is going to work, you need to have that other piece. And you might look at it and say, well, you know, we kind of anchored our future to what KP can do and the fact that he's under delivering yet again in a third season now actually playing with us that's hamstringing us i hear you it doesn't matter you have to figure it out and some people will say like well we we made we gave up the assets we had our tradable assets to get kp yes and no like you didn't have to give up a lot like the reason at this point i would say the knicks won the trade, the reason I say that is because they didn't anchor themselves or rather tether themselves to Porzingis and that contract he was going to demand. The fact that he's making $30 million to be out five out of eight games with lower back tightness, given his other injury history with us alone, let alone pre, uh, pre-Mavericks pre days, is uh, burdensome. The Knicks have no one left on that team from the trade. Obviously, the one other piece that they had uh, Nilakina is now a Maverick, but you kind of think of it and you're like, the reason you would say they won is because they freed themselves up to make the other moves that did turn them around finally. Good for them. Credit. That's a weird situation where a blockbuster trade, you kind of feel like on the merit of just the players in the deal alone, no one won. And yet in the case of the Knicks, they at least freed themselves up to rebuild and they've managed to do so very well. Kudos. I don't know for the Mavericks. Like, you can't keep saying, all right, well, it's KP and he just has to play like the number two. Dude, I'm not banking on that at this point. 
At, at this point, even if Porzingis gave us eighty mm, percent of the remaining games, I would still say, "All right, cool. That's something at least." But are you going to play like the number two option in those games? We haven't really seen a good Porzingis game yet this year. We've seen a couple okay ones, but not, nothing substantiative. Nothing that you look at and say, all right, that's the KP I want. I feel like this might somehow actually be yet another regression year for him. And if that's the case, then all right, see if you can get a bag of beans. At this point, it's a matter of the contract and how it hamstrings you for your salary cap. You got to do something because I'm not throwing out the the coaching staff or anything like that yet for the Mavericks, but at the very least, I'm raising significant questions about the composition of the roster because even if these guys are hitting their threes, they're a middle-of-the-pack-at-best team, and it's because of a foundational issue. It's because you don't have guys that can create other than Luka. Everything is still on him. And I think he's trying to trust in his teammates more and allow them to kind of create. Brunson, like I said, has been probably your second at maybe at worst third best player this year. And, you know, I like Brunson. I'd like to see him get a new contract. But good googly moogly, I'm not willing to, to say that that's an ideal structure for him to be our second or third best player. That's just not the case. So anyway, like I said, Mavericks get out of San Antonio with a 109-108 win. They are 5-3, and three, still currently third in the Western Conference. That's great, but now they've got another interesting challenge coming to town in a couple days in the form of the Boston Celtics. So we'll get a, a good evaluation of how they're doing on that front. Hopefully, they can kind of keep some momentum because they haven't really been able to string anything significant together here. Let me see. I'm curious what the Celtics' current record is. I haven't kept up with them as much. They're 3-5, and five, so they're struggling. But I do tend to believe they're going to be a better team, that they'll be a playoff team in the East still. But we'll see. So like the video, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!